Hello and welcome back to my partners in crime. Welcome back to Murder Analyze for another true crime. And as we're looking, isn't aren't we, through October at some of the most terrible crimes really committed by some of these terrible, evil people. Um, this case, I think, has it all in it. You know, if you're talking about um, a case that would be made into a horror movie, then this is probably the one that would do it. Um, we're talking about two brothers because I've had to join them together even though the crimes are separate because we want to look at the childhood as well as these. Now we speak a lot don't we about what makes a serial killer, are they born to kill, are they made to kill, clearly in this situation you know and I think people say don't they you know that nature takes you know puts a loaded gun in the hands but it's the nurture that then pulls the trigger and I think it's quite clear in this case that their upbringing um, did really disturb these people when you have four boys to one family and two of them end up being killer and one being suspected a serial killer then there's something really going on in this family and I, I think this case and I'm gonna have to put a warning out with this case because really it's one of the most disturbing cases you know we're talking about the murder of a six-year-old child right the way through really uh, we're talking about dismemberment and we're talking about cannibalism there's so much in this case but really what we want to focus on in this case is yes we're going to talk about the crimes because we have to to show you an idea of really just how bad these pair were in their own right really but this Haddon Clark these Clark's brothers and this Haddon Clark being the younger of the two brothers that the killers um, just shows you about his crimes really we need to join them together because of how disturbing this case is you know each case is disturbing in its own but put together this is a really disturbing case so just take a warning of this this case is not for you there's plenty more to watch on murder analyze or to listen to on let's have a chat about murder so again before i start can you please subscribe it would be lovely if you would do that hit the like button hit the um, notification bell hello to my lovely lovely members and thank you so much for sticking with us and also for our super thanks you know really without you this channel wouldn't continue to be able to do what it does so thank you for that i really appreciate it as always you know you are my focus when i do these cases and um, I just want to make sure that people understand how people work and when we have children being brought up in such a way the damage that that can cause to them kids in the very early stages of their life you know we must always think what we're saying or doing to a child you know could potentially make them into a serial killer now also in this case I'm going to bring up the Carol Cole case uh, which you can find on here I'll leave a link on there for that because also his childhood has, has really a lot to do with why he became a serial killer and also Edmund Kemper the third and he's all um, also on here and have a look at his case all these four people really had childhoods that really aided in their you know really in the creation of some of the worst killers that's ever known to man. So let's get on with it. So how I'm going to start, I'm going to go over each of their crimes. So let's start with Haddon Clark. Haddon Irvin Clark, he was born the 31st of July 1952. He is an American veteran. He was a murder, he is a murderer and he is suspected of being a serial killer. Um, it's probably well known and you know I think he's sort of told other cellmates and that, that he's probably killed up to about 13 people you might know this case by the cross dress killer because he dressed in women's clothes and stuff and that also relates back to his childhood as well so you know you may know this case by lots of different things but whatever you know it by it's one of the most shocking cases I think so he was he's currently serving two 30 year sentences in Eastern um, Correctional Institution uh, in Westover in Maryland for the murders of the six-year-old child Michelle Dorr in 1986 and 23-year-old Laura Hullington who was uh, in 1992. He was also given a 10-year sentence for robbery after stealing um, from his former landlord. So these are the cases with Haddon that we know 
the six-year-old child. Now it's very sad really when we talk about this little girl because she was uh, six at the time of her murder. She had gone to stay with her father. They had joint custody, the father and the mother, and it was his weekend to have her. And he'd put up a little swimming pool in the garden for her and he was watching some sport on the telly. And as you know, most people, when you're engrossed in the telly or engrossed in something else, he says it was about half an hour that um, he hadn't checked on her for about half an hour. When he went into the back garden to look for her, um, she was nowhere to be found. Now she had a little friend that lived a couple of doors up from there and he thought she's probably walked up the road. You know, this is 1986. So, you know, yes, there were serial killers about and people did know about it, but you think you're in the garden, you've put up the pole, you've popped in the house watching the telly, probably for more than half an hour, uh, as it turns out later on, thinking this child's all right, she's gonna come in and out and she's gone. Uh, so he's gone up then to the neighbours two doors up to see if um, little Michelle was there. Now the neighbours said, oh no, we've just got in. Um, we've been shopping all day and um, her little friend was with us. So we took her, so there was no one in the house. So what they decided to do was, well, check the garden and everything because she may have just gone in the back garden and started playing on the toys in that garden. But there was no, she was nowhere to be found. So they've looked everywhere and in the end they've called the police. And to tell you the truth, from that day, really, in uh, 1986, on that day of that murder, uh, nothing had been seen or heard of Michelle Dore for about 12 years. But it turns out that two doors up from her friend was Haddon Clark. He was staying with his brother at the time there. Later on, he admits to the murder of Michelle Dore and um, says that she had knocked on her friend's door and he had seen her and he said to her, oh, she's in here. Now we're talking about a six year old child. So she's gone into his home, his brother's out, she's gone into the home. And he says then that he slit her throat and also drained her blood from her and then drunk her blood. That's what he said he did to little Michelle, Michelle Dore, this six year old child. So now let's talk about the murder of Laura, this beautiful, young woman, stunning, really, lovely family, she was a Harvard graduate, she had her whole life ahead of her, but what happened was when she was away at university or college in Harvard, and she was just finishing, when she was coming home for weekends um, to stay with her mother. Now her mother was um, in this local church, she was a a church goer, she was a lovely woman um, and uh, Laura was their only child. So when Laura came back to visit her mother had hired this gardener and handyman and stuff and she'd had him because she'd met him through this church so she'd had him working for her for a few months and they'd become friends. She, he, he listened, she said he was a bit weird this person but he was good to her and he'd done handy stuff around the house, around the garden, so she gave him a key. That gardener and that handyman was Haddon Clark. This killer, really. The reason they believed that he killed Laura was when the mother, you know, invited him in and Laura came back home, she thought that there was something strange about this man and she said to her mum, Listen, this isn't good, you need to sort of get rid of him. He's, I feel uncomfortable around him. He's a very strange person. I don't really like it. I'm a bit worried. And so the mother said, yes, that's fine. Okay, you know, don't worry, I'll, I'll start to get rid of him. So he knew that Laura could see something in him, but the mother couldn't. The mother was very forgiving. She was, a, a, as I say, a churchgoer. She was, um, she believed that giving people a chance and helping people and stuff would really, you know, it was part of what she believed in. She wanted to make sure that everyone felt okay and she thought giving him little jobs around the house and the garden would give him a bit of money, 
you know, as she said, yes, she understood he was strange, but she believed that he was harmless. She believed that he was harmless. And actually, so did the local um, vicar or priest, whoever it was, in this church, believed, you know, that, yes, he was unusual, he was strange, he, he used to dress sometimes in women's clothing and stuff, but they accepted him for his differences. They took him in. And because the church took him in, Laura's mother took him in and really then started this relationship. When Laura turned up, of course, she wasn't so easily fooled either. You're talking about a Harvard graduate, a really stunning looking woman starting off her life and Haddon just hated her. He hated her. And the reason they think he killed her is because one of his jealousy, because he wanted to be her, but she was getting in the way of his life so she had to go so laura's mother this weekend said listen i have to pop away and um are you going to be in town and so laura said yes I, i'm i'm going to be here for the weekend um i've just got a few things to do because she was going for a different job and stuff like that or a job so she has some things to do and so the mother said goodbye to her and i'll see you on monday when i get back i'm popping away and this young girl, really, was then in this property. Now, Haddon had been sort of told to keep away, but the mother had given him a key, they believe. So he let himself in to that property, probably when Laura was in bed, because once they looked into this bedroom, there was blood everywhere. But Laura had been seen, you see, over that weekend walking along which she'd been seen on that Monday morning walking along or so people thought the thing is with Haddon that he was a cross dresser and so he dressed up as Laura to make it look like she had left that property and gone to this job interview that she was going to so that sort of took him out of that equation because she had been seen on that Monday he came under suspect, I think, once they sort of looked at the, the house and the room and stuff like that. And he was not only linked, had links to Michelle Dawes' case, even though they couldn't prove it was him because there was no body found at that point. And then Laura's body, again, you know, um, just she was just murdered by this man. So in the end, he was... They was looking, I think, for the bodies. They was looking for stuff of these bodies. Even though they couldn't prove that he had something to do with it, the police sort of, he was their main suspect for a very long time. In the end, he was arrested for uh, Laura's murder. And then um, I think where his grandfather had owned property on Cape Cod, so then, you know, he doesn't come from a poor family this boy there was a grave the grandfather's grave or the father's grave that was dug up a little bit and they believed that some of the remains were there and that's where they sort of started looking but when they checked out the grave even though there had been something buried there in that grave it was missing so what had Haddon moved from that grave so if it wasn't the body of Michelle Dorr because she was found in the wooded area, actually about 12 years later, close to her home, and it wasn't the body of Laura, what else was he burying there? So his case, and this is why they think he's potentially a serial killer, plus some of the things he's said about, you know, and he said he did cannibalize certain things, but the thing is, when we talk about his brother, his brother was in prison at the time when he was arrested for Laura's murder and all these other murders come out. And he was a cannibal, right? The brother was a cannibal. So did Hayden just think, well, when I talk about Michelle, I'm gonna, you know, Michelle Dore, this little six-year-old, where I slit her throat, you know, slit her throat, drained her blood, drunk the blood. Is that gonna make me more like my brother or did he really do that? When we really look at this childhood, he probably did do that, probably a lot more. So there's a lot more to Haddon, Clark, than you think. But because of the evidence, you know, is not there 
for these missing girls and kids that had gone missing around in this area. He sort of tried to say to the police when he was talking about the bodies on shown and where the bodies were, he had to dress in underwear, women's underwear and a bra. And that's actually, he says, how he killed. It gave him this different personality came out when he dressed as a woman or he had to wear the underwear and this bra which made him feel comfortable and that literally comes straight from his childhood. So we'll just talk about his brother's case and then we'll go on to the childhood so you can really understand where this person or persons are coming from when they're talking about how they killed and why they killed. So let's now talk about his brother, this uh, uh, Bradfield Clark, you know, cannibals, really. He was a cannibal, without a doubt, he was a cannibal. Um, it says here, and a, and a lot of people have said, people that knew them in when they were young, that they were these mean-spirited people. They were just really, really bad-tempered, quick-tempered, evil people, really, that would think nothing of you know, starting fights and this, that and the other. So when we look at this Bradfield's case, he had a, um, he was working and his victim, she was a co-worker really. She was married, happily married, and he'd invited both her and her husband round for something to eat, you know, tea. So he was the older brother of Haddon. This, this man. So in the summer of 1984, he was already in prison, this man, for the murder of, um, I think her name was Trish um, Mark. Now, <laughs> he'd invited her and her husband around, as I said, for dinner. They, the husband couldn't make it for some reason, so she went along. Don't forget, this man come across as a normal everyday man, he was working and everything, but what she didn't know is he was infatuated with her. Now these brothers, through their whole life, um, really, if they couldn't have what they wanted, they would just take it. And I think there were some sexual advances made out the dinner that she went to, you know, when she invited her around. Don't forget, she's gone into his home now to have this dinner. The husband knows where she is, it's all been organised, but he couldn't make it, so she's gone. If the husband had made it, he'd have been dead too, without a doubt. Because this man wanted this Trish any way he could get her. So it turns out that through the dinner, or this is what, you know, is surmised, that through this dinner, he's sort of put sexual advances towards her and she's rejected him. She said, hang on a minute, you know, I'm married. What are you doing? I've only come around for a bit of dinner. Don't forget there's co-workers, they'd worked together for a while. She thought she knew him, she thought she trusted him. And he's now turned. Now what he's done, because she's you know, rejected his sexual advances, he's literally smashed her head in against a wall. And then he's thought, mm, I'm going to rape you anyway, which he did. Then he chopped up her body, but that wasn't enough for him. He thought, let's have total control here, total power over this victim. I'm now going to slice parts of your body up, I'm going to cook it on the barbecue, and I'm going to eat you. And that's what he did. And then, after a few days, he chopped the rest of her body up, put the body parts in the back of the car, drove to the local police station, and handed himself in, and said, her body's in the car, chopped up. That was the brother. That was the mentality of the brother. Now he says that's his only kill, and to tell you the truth, I think I actually believe him. Because, you know, it's very unusual that any killer is going to walk into a police station and give their self up. But I think even he couldn't believe how far he had gone with that murder, to where he had become a cannibal, really. The total power of this man over this woman, that was all part of it. But I think he was disgusted with himself to tell you the truth I think that he had some remorse for what he did and that's why when he walked in to that police station and handed himself in that was the last of him and of course he went to prison for the rest of his life because really when we think about it this was a killer that would only ever kill again if he had the chance without a doubt but at least he gave himself up 
a year later was after that that Haddon Clark was arrested for these murders and um, to tell the truth he may be the second oldest out of the four brothers but he's probably the worst. So let's go now for this overview of this case really and let's really look at all the facts and the childhood because it really means something. Plus though there is mental health in this, there is schizophrenia that runs through this but also schizophrenia is usually brought on by traumas and stuff like that and when we look at his childhood, uh, both their childhoods really, um, this is what I'm saying, what we do to our children at a very young age can really you know, determine what their life's going to be like. Some people have terrible childhoods and can get through it, some don't, some are so impacted by the traumas in childhood that they end up being killers like this. So Clark was the second, or Hayden Clark was the second of four brothers and was born and raised in Troy in New York. His brother Brad, uh, Bradfield Clark, the one that strangled the woman in California before eating um, her <laughs> several body parts really by cooking them on this barbecue. So Clark's parents were both alcoholics. They were often fought um, each other in front of the children, which happens a lot, but again, we don't know how bad this was because when they were so drunk most of the time I mean they absolutely was meant to be slaughtered most of the time and this house was a living nightmare for these kids when it comes to the arguing and the constant bickering from these parents of these children I don't know sometimes why people have children if it's going to cause them so much stress and you know uh, it's just terrible really when you think about it but Clark's mother had four boys. Now, don't forget, he was the second oldest brother. So she'd already had um, Bradfield, and you know, he was just brought up in this manic home life. But when she had Haddon, Clark, she wanted a girl. She wanted a girl. So what she did was, she started to dress him as a girl and treat him as a girl, even though he was a boy. Don't forget, when you're dressing these kids up as, you know, when they're babies, they don't notice, but when they still get to six, seven, eight, nine, and you're still trying to dress them up and pretend that they're a girl, the bullying starts, the, you know, all this stuff starts, you know, their peers start to look at them and think, what's going on with you? Especially in this day and age where you know, it just wasn't acceptable, was it, really? But this boy was forced to dress as a girl by the mother. And was treated like a girl you know the hair done like a girl this boy was so violent by the time he was seven or eight year old he was violent he was also then because of this household and how he was made to dress and how he was made to feel by people you know around him um, he sort of started then to kids he didn't like in his street he would take their pets and he would torture and kill their pets. So now we have this escalation, don't we? It started young. It's well known by his friends that his temper was terrible. He was a vindictive person. If you upset him or if he didn't like you or he thought your family was better than his, he would go and take your pets and kill them, torture and kill them. So very, very, you know, I think when we look at serial killers, certain serial killers, a lot of them start from uh, with animals, again, because animals are very vulnerable, they can't speak, they can't really help themselves, you know, they may try and bite you a dog or, or whatever else, but really once you've got that dog where you want it, that you can do anything with it, and this is where his sort of fascination, really, for torture and murder and dismemberment and stuff started that's where it started but both these boys were quite vicious they were very very evil children by their upbringing they were brought up in violence they were brought up in with alcohol they were brought up you know to be dressed up like had to be dressed up in something he didn't want to do but I think as he became later on in his life when he started to kill people and he says he killed people from sort of teenage years to tell you the truth so the escalation from animals to people was quite quick 
with him that he felt comfortable once when he put on the underwear and the bras and stuff it made him feel more confident plus I suppose the only um, thing he ever got from his mother when you talk about you know um, any care was when he was dressed up as a child as a girl she gave him that attention that he wasn't getting as the boy it separated him from the others because she was so desperate even though she had two other children after that which were all boys he felt that that's the only connection really with his mother was when he was dressed up and she would show him more attention and that's then what made him kill in this as he was cross-dressing really it gave him that empowerment it brought him joy it, it made him feel good to do that so you know he's a very strange man but don't forget this mother was a nightmare right it was an absolute nightmare these people had a bit of money i think he was a chemist i think i think he was the father but he was an alcoholic violent aggressive alcoholic the mother was an alcoholic and when she was at slaughter she used to dress him up and cuddle him and god knows what else she'd do to this boy this boy was messed up from such an early age but then the father uh, eventually committed suicide right so listen when we talk about a family with four children in it four boys and two of them are killers and one's probably a serial killer without a doubt something in that family unit is wrong isn't it and it as i've said before it is where nature you know gives you the gun but it's the nurture it's the treatment of these children that sometimes pulls that trigger and sets off something that can't be stopped it really comes down with this lot really when you think about it to their childhood there's clear signs here that that was the real reason why these boys did what they did then we've got i think haven't we about the bullying right this bullying effect when you have these kids taunting in school calling you names because they know that your mum dresses you as a you know as a girl and you're a boy you know how did that impact on his life really at that very early age now when we talk about carol cole and i said i was going to bring carol cole into this because carol cole's mother did the same thing to him he also killed i think at the age of 10 he killed um a fellow student that used to taunt him about his name and how his mother used to dress him as a girl carol cole carol in them days really is a girl's name so he was taunted for that his whole life and really blames his mother as well for the impact on his life um, of that and that's really what started it off but this boy killed at the age of 10 carol cole through the same sort of situations so there is a link here for that isn't there where these kids are growing up he was also torturing animals and everything else and also killing at the age of 10. hayden clark has stated that he was killing animals at a very young age and especially the the animals that belonged to the kids that were bullying him so he couldn't get to them kids but when he got to about 13 14 that's when he says he started to kill so we have the same similar facts here you have edmund kemper again tortured really by his mother she hated him actually the mother you know she did she hated him but he was a very strange child he used to also pretend to be on you know in the gas chamber and um you know do things he tried then to hurt his sisters and stuff and his mother then put him in the basement so he says and she put them in the basement to protect him from his other uh, or to protect her children from him but his hatred for his mother was really bad really bad he said that she was nagging and everything else and he hated her she treated me like she treated my father she despised my father she despised me these killers have all got issues from very young and it's all to do with their mothers it's all to do with their mothers now in the end you know 
Kempel killed, didn't he? Not only his maternal grandparents at the age of 15, but then he also went on to kill many, many more, the co ed killer, wasn't he? Uh, but he also killed his mother. Also, he did chop body parts up and he kept that mother's head and other heads and stuff and done sexual things to them heads. So, this is the power of what we can do to our children, to how we can take a child, probably a normal child, right? may have had some form of something when they was born but it wouldn't have been so extreme hayden as with others uh, that we've sort of mentioned um i think um carol cole was diagnosed at a young age with schizophrenia but then it was proven not to i think um kemper he was diagnosed with schizophrenia again proven not to be uh, something else but Hayden was also diagnosed at a very young age with schizophrenia. Now schizophrenia is there and it can be brought on by shock or trauma and stuff like this. Their childhood, these, you know, Clark's brother's childhoods were traumatic to say the least. So this is why they went on to kill in the way they did because of their upbringing, really. You know, it doesn't matter how much money you've got because these people weren't poor. They weren't poor at all. You know, good lifestyle. But in that home, it was a tremendous torture for these children. Some kids can take it and some kids can't. And these kids can, two out of the four, couldn't take it. So Hayden Clark, he was uh, trained as a chef actually in the United States Navy until he was discharged after being diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Over the years, he'd held a number of menial jobs. Now, the thing is with any killer like this, when you've got other things going on in your mind, you can't concentrate on these great careers. You're just not gonna have one. Really, it's very, very difficult to maintain that job. And he was definitely, you know, he had all, didn't he, all the ticks when we're ticking off what a serial killer is. This Hayden Clark ticks them all. He ticks all the boxes, the bad childhood, you know, the mental health illnesses, everything else that's going against this boy is, is, is against him. So Clark was arrested multiple times for theft. Um, he was arrested for robbery, for vandalising a former landlord's property and committing several thefts. So if, you, if he didn't like you or if you tried to evict him for something like not paying rent, he was coming back for you in a big way. So he was very, very vindictive. He couldn't drop something and really he just wouldn't have it. If you'd done something to this man, you was going to pay in one way or another. So let's talk about the 31st of May 1986. Now Clark's brother had ordered him to move out of the home just before Michelle Dorr went missing. He'd had enough of him, really. He's, he's one of the other brothers, the younger brothers. had said, you know, I've had enough. You just have to get out. And again, though, now, something's happened to Haddon, Clark, that he didn't like. He's been told you need to leave. You know, people have had enough of you. I've had enough of you. By the brother. So the brother had sort of thought he was packing his stuff and that's why his brother wasn't there. So, um, and this was in Silver Springs in Maryland. Now, so Michelle Dorr was his six-year-old friend of a niece. And he came looking over, you know, came looking, didn't she, for a little friend who lived this couple of doors up, as I've said before. So as he said to her, you know, the, the little girl's upstairs, your friend's upstairs, come up and, you know, have a chat with her. As she got up to the top of the stairs, this little six-year-old, Michelle, he literally stabbed her to death, then he slit her throat, and then he drank her blood. That's what he said he did. He shoved her in a duffel bag, because where he drained all her blood out, there wasn't much of this little girl left, to tell you the truth. And he buried her in a park about 12 miles away. That's what he did just because his brother his younger brother had said you need to leave the property again someone has said something that's upset him this vengeance comes back you can't do that i'm going to show you and he took that out on the six-year-old girl so we're talking about aren't we 1986 and then we jump now to 1992 it's a long gap 
86 to 92 for a killer like him. So that's why they think there's multiple kills here because they don't think this man ever stopped. But probably, as we now know, because he sort of said he killed from a teenager, that probably Michelle Daw was not his first either. She certainly wasn't his last. He went on then to need to kill Laura on October the 18th, 1992. He killed 23 year old Laura. Uh, she lived in Maryland and Clark was working as a gardener at Laura's mother's property. Uh, Penny and she accused Haddon of stealing some tools and sort of stuff like this. Again, you know, this dislike, I didn't do it. He probably did because he was a thief as well as a liar and everything else. Usually all serial killers are. He wasn't a great manipulator to tell you the truth. He came across as more of a sad case than someone that could manipulate his way through life. He used, I think, the sadness of his life and you know the how people thought he looked different to get by life certainly not manipulation that wasn't his skill but he was a thief so they say he entered uh, through the back door and he stabbed um laura to death in the in her bedroom and then he suffocated her he sort of wrapped her in a sheet at this point he then dragged the body out through the back door into the wooded area behind about half a mile and he buried her body there. He later returned dressed up in a wig um, and woman's clothes and left through the front door to make people think that Laura had left because don't forget he was a cross dresser and also they believe that he was infatuated with Laura to tell her the truth. Um, he liked the look of her and he wanted to be her. That's sort of what they say happened with Laura. But to tell the truth, Laura was getting in his way and um, the minute sort of accusations come across where it would threaten his sort of lifestyle or his connection with that mother, she was always going to be murdered. And the mo luckily the mother was away because she probably would have been murdered as well. I think Clark Haddon, Haddon Clark was linked to a um, pillowcase or some um, print on the, finger, uh, on the pillowcase of um, Haddon, so whether it was his uh, fingerprints or something, there was blood on that and it was linked to him and that's how he was arrested then for the murder of Laura. Um, and that was about eight months after actually the murder. The police began looking for him as a real suspect now in Michelle Dawes' case because he was at that time living with his brothers two or three doors up from the property where Michelle went missing. And that's how then that this case broke for both but it was about 12 years actually after little um, Michelle's body was found so really her parents really for a very long time. I think there were some issues as I said with the timeline at the time of the murder why he wasn't arrested first because the father had said that he was watching sport and it was probably about half an hour or so later on it was sort of realised that he had probably been watching the TV and she'd been in this garden for much more longer than half an hour and so the timeline fitted then and that's how then they knew that actually Haddon Clark had killed um, this poor little girl on that day literally as I said just for literally his brother asking him to leave the property. So these allegations of other murders and stuff like that that he said so Clark confessed to murdering dozens of people starting as a teenager he was sent uh, he sent a letter actually claiming that he had killed an identified woman in or an identified woman in Cape Cod in Massachusetts in 1974 known as the lady of the dunes um, Clark explained that he had buried evidence from the crimes in his grandfather's garden and that was the beautiful house in Cape Cod that he had so as I said these people may have had money and they may have had a great upbringing on the outside but what was going on inside this household was traumatic to say the least. Um, they then thought the identification of this um, woman, um, and I, he said he was going to tell the authorities and stuff, um, and he said that they'd mistreated him and stuff, the authorities, so he wasn't going to say much, but he was a paranoid schizophrenic as well. So it's really hard when you have someone who is a paranoid schizophrenic from a very young age, and it seems like he was from a very young age, even though he was diagnosed when he was in the Navy, that would have been, you know, 1920, I suppose he would have been, which is a time when schizophrenia does show itself, but the symptoms probably were there for a lot, lot longer, um, but no one had really picked them up. His family certainly wouldn't have picked them up because 
really. Um, they were oblivious to it, the father already died by them, so that was another traumatic experience, I suppose, even losing his father and stuff like that. So schizophrenia, it's difficult to um, for them to distinguish at the time, because he would have been unmedicated, what was real and what wasn't real. So can we believe um, that he's killed many, many more? Probably he's killed many more people, without a doubt. But whether it's the people he thinks he's killed or as many as he thinks he's killed, it's unclear, really. It's very hard when you have someone with such a mental health illness that hasn't been medicated and they may have been going through episodes, you know, constantly or long episodes that last quite a long time to really remember what he had done and what was real and what wasn't real. But without a doubt, this boy is a killer in his own right and we know the two that he's killed and probably potential of a lot more because of the way he was brought up because of the way he's displaying this behavior as a child and his early kills yeah i would say yeah he's actually um quite a large serial killer and um, when we look at serial killers he's probably one of the ones on the top there just because he doesn't remember and sometimes he may be confused about details doesn't mean to say he's innocent of it. And as we spoke about with many serial killers, you know, they like to keep these trinkets, don't they, reminders. They like these items to keep something from the victims, don't they? Well, when they looked, the police looked when they were investigating lots of the crimes that he said he had done and stuff, when they actually searched the grandfather's property, this beautiful property really, there was a plastic bucket they found. And there was more than 200 pieces of jewellery in there, amongst other items. Some of them were Laura's as well. Uh, there was a high school class ring that was found in there. And he says, Clark, Hayden Clark, or Haddon Clark, said that these were trophies. He took them from all his victims. So if we look at the amount of stuff that was found in this plastic bucket, and we listen to what he's saying, the potential victims Haddon Clark is over 200. Over 200. Because we know he kept nothing from Michelle's door murder. He drank her blood, that was enough for him. So if there's other kids or there's other victims out there that he hadn't kept trinkets or trophies to remember, to remind himself of that kill, uh, there's probably a potential for a lot more than that. So yes, he has got schizophrenia. It is difficult to prove that he's done that amount of murders, but when we find a killer, a known killer, with many, many items, you know, from dead victims as well, we have to assume that what he's saying is the truth and that he is probably one of the biggest serial killers America's ever seen. And he needed to be took off the streets you know, we've took, talked about Gacy with his 33 kills. We've talked about, you know, others. Some have only killed 17. Some have killed, you know, 27. We're talking about this one. Over 200 people. Now, the investigation still goes on with this case, as with many of these serial killers, because of the trinkets found and, the, you know, what they call the trophies are found. Um, trying to find out who owns these trophies, trying to find out burial sites of what he's done with these victims, um, as with many other cases when it concerns people that still bodies have never been found, never been found. Now he was lucky, or they was lucky to tell the truth, that he showed where the bodies of the two victims that he had admitted to, he showed them where that was. But other than that, no, he won't. And if he does go out and show them anything, he has to wear, and the police have to, and the, and the you know, the um, prison has to allow him to wear uh, the women's underwear because that's how he feels comfortable. And also that then stimulates and bring back the memories of them kills. So that's why he's known as a cross-dresser killer because he needed that to be that killer and, but he also needed it when he talked about them kills to bring back their memories. It's another part. But again, all this, both these cases of these brothers, the Clark's brothers, you know, terrible killers, 
terrible killers really but really some of the blame here or the majority of the blame for the way these children have turned out as adults some of the worst or Hayden Haddon especially one of the worst serial killers is because of his upbringing so we must always think when we do to children how we treat our children in the very early years can determine how they finish lives really how they grow up in normal society can they fit into normal society not all the time they can't and it just shows you doesn't it that sometimes these parents that drink and are violent and dress their kids up because they have something wrong with them really you know because she couldn't have a girl let me choose this child to dress up the torment that this boy had gone through at a very young age really plus the destruction in this house of their home life was awful and as I said they had the money right they had the income they weren't poor they didn't have that thrown in but you had two parents that were such drunks such nasty pieces of work that dragged these children up abused these children physically and mentally abused these children to make them turn out to be some of the most deadliest people alive so thank you for watching you know what to do if you've liked this case put your thumbs up uh, you can subscribe if you'd like i appreciate it be very helpful it just helps the channel grow and we love it um, you can also hit the notification bell um, you can do all the things you'd like to do you can leave me comments because I love that and you can also listen to this on let's have a chat about murder on the podcast um, if that's more easier for you because I know that I have lots of podcasters on there who walk their dogs four miles I had one the other day who walks their dog four miles a day I mean that dog must be loving it really eh? really when you think about it but these are interesting cases aren't they and they have to be told no matter how bad they are so as I say, you know, let's have a chat about murder. So thanks for joining me. Until the next time, bye-bye.